All right, so um, it is a pleasure today. We have actually a trifecta of uh, great talks today, and, and uh, we'll be led off by Alex Essex, a professor at, the, at Western University in Ontario, Canada, who's done a, a great deal of work on both building and breaking supposedly secure um, voting systems, including internet voting systems, um, and has at times become a thorn in the side of, um, of various Canadian jurisdictions, ruining their brands in, in some cases, or, or tempting. Oh, but um, we'll, we'll let, let Alex tell the stories. So welcome, Alex. Thank it you. reminds me of this quote from Nightmare Before Christmas. I, I'm the who when you call who's there. So... <laughs> Um, but it's only our democracy after all, so I hope it's uh, all for something. So the worst form, including all those others, uh, which is, you know, um, kind of, I, I hope to convince you uh, of how, maybe not how to do online voting, but how not to do online voting. So um, as we were speaking about just moments ago, um, Canada has uh, the three uh, major uh, jurisdictions, the local, provincial, uh, slash territorial, and federal elections. Um, the kinds of voting that occurs at each of these elections uh, is, is different. Um, so federally, we, can, we do hand-counted, hand-marked paper ballots. Yeah, and, and I mean, like, for real. And it's always fun to come to the United States because the idea of a hand-counted paper ballot is just, like, so outrageous that you bring it up and it immediately kills the conversation. But we actually do it, and it works really, really well. In fact, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's like the, the best thing that we have so far, although maybe Election Guard will change that. Um, uh, but we are able to do it because unlike the U.S., uh, when you vote in a federal race, there's one, one race. You're a member of parliament, and there's usually like four or five candidates. So the ballot is this big, and there's just one of them every four years, roughly. So really easy to hand count. Um, and so it's actually funny because in the United States, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people that are arguing about ballot marking devices. And uh, so I uh, had tweeted out that I was going to be at Microsoft giving a talk. And then, uh, you know, we're you know, going to be doing research into new ways of doing uh, uh, voting. And somebody said, oh, it's simple. Hand marked paper ballots. Done. And uh, my uh, point was, well, why stop at hand uh, marking? Well, you know, why not get, you know, get the hand counting in here? You know, we, we certainly do it. But... What we've also done is we've leapfrogged over the U.S. into the deep end of uh, online voting. So we are starting to see online voting uh, really taking hold in the uh, municipal uh, government. So your mayors and your local councillors, uh, Ontario and Nova Scotia are doing it. We have, um, you know, we, we have more people voting online right now uh, in Canada than in Estonia, the originators uh, of online voting. Uh, we also are seeing it uh, being used very heavily in, uh, like, what the U.S. equivalent would be like the primary races. So, you know, Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada, was elected to his party through an online vote. So it's, it's, it's increasingly prevalent. But here's the problem. We don't have any analog to the various um, protection measures that are being um, developed in the United States, as flawed or as limited as they may or may not be. Uh, we don't have an EAC or a, or, or a NIST. Well, we have a CS, Canadian Standards Agency, but they don't do anything with voting. We don't have a VBSG. People might not know what those stand for. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, you, well, okay. The U.S. Election Assistance Commission, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. You should know what this is, okay? The Voluntary Voting System Guidelines. Uh, in the United States, you don't have... Uh, the federal government doesn't have the ability, the legislative ability, to uh, tell states how to run an election. Um, but in lieu of that, they have created this, uh, you know, this nice document, the VVSG, and, and there's several versions of it, uh, to say, if you were going to do something, maybe you should do this. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not a mandatory standard, it's a voluntary standard, right? Um, we don't do risk-limiting audits in Canada, and in fact, I've had conversations with election officials that suggest that they might even be illegal. Uh, so we have to get our laws sorted out before we could even do anything like that. And basically, there's really no kind of auditing that goes on. Now, if you're talking about hand-counted paper ballots, uh, you don't need auditing. You don't need RLAs because the candidate representatives stand there as you count them up. They see paper go into a box. The box spills out on the table at night. They were walking around the place the whole day. It's like seeing is believing. Um, it's the closest thing that I can think of to uh, what I would want an electronic version to replicate. 
Um, we don't have any standards for the use of election technology, um, and there's no obvious political or legal pathways towards standards as far as I can tell. Uh, the Ontario Municipal Elections Act, for example, uh, has this great uh, notion of what they call the alternative voting method. So if you're going to vote in a paper ballot election, here are like 50 rules that you have to follow to a T. Or you can say, we're going to do alternative voting. And then you can do whatever you want. So basically, uh, we have federally a lot of uh, very strict kind of behavior. And then um, sort of lower down, it's just kind of a, well, I've called it a wild west uh, in the past. And I've, I've been surprised to see other high-ranking election officials also use that term as well. We're starting to also see for the first time uh, the, uh, t uh, the Northwest Territories, which will be the first subnational government in Canada. They're going to use online voting um, later this year for the first time. So this is like we're kind of breaking the seal here into the sort of... Um, so the Northwest Territories is a territory which is similar to a U.S. territory in the sense that they don't have the, the same kind of constitutional um, inherent self, self, right to self-governance uh, on certain... Uh, legislative issues, but they're kind of not like U.S. territories in the sense that there are voting uh, members of parliament that are in the uh, in the legislature. Okay, so who's using? Yeah, it might be justified because it's tiny communities spread far apart. Yes, so to, uh, that, that, that is precisely the argument that's being used. Um, uh, I had someone uh, s s tell me that they thought there were more dogs in the Northwest Territory than people. Uh, we're talking about a landmass that is twice the size of Texas, uh, although that's not remarkable in Canada. Most states are about the size of Texas or bigger. So, um, but you know what's bigger than uh, the largest subnational division in Canada, and that is uh, Greenland. So just, just, just uh, think about it. So okay. So, yeah. so who's using? <laughs> you said it on me. Okay. So who's using uh, online voting? Okay. Well, this is a, this turns out to be a. Um, a non-trivial question to answer um, because you would think that something as risque as online voting would uh, be carefully uh, monitored. Um, but so far, the problem is that uh, the, the only numbers that we really have for who's using online voting are coming from the vendors themselves. The vendors are self-reporting how many communities they're, they're um, servicing. But it turns out that in many cases, the numbers that they're presenting are wrong. Now, they're not wrong necessarily because they're trying to be misleading, but let's just say they, in many cases, are trying to be optimistic. Uh, so they present numbers that, that in point of fact, are, are in, in each point of fact, uh, have been higher than the actual number of, of uh, municipalities. So, so here, here are three different vendors. Here's uh, Dominion, uh, which is a, a big uh, player in, in the United States market. Um, they, 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 didn't, uh, they didn't have 51 Ontario municipalities in that, uh, in that election, so I, I don't know where they got that number from. But here's the problem. Um, we actually don't know which cities are using it. I wrote to the um, Ontario uh, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and I said, look, we're doing a study. Can you tell us who's using online voting? And they wrote back and they said, well, um, the decision to use online voting rests in the city. Uh, not with the ministry, uh, so we don't know. We, we don't track it. Um, so that information just didn't exist. So the vendors at that point were kind of free to just make up numbers, and uh, you know, we—I we, mean, this. So this 194 was used in the press, like in every news article that I saw. Um, but that's that turned out not to be the number. So I don't know where they got that number from, and they never explained it, which is kind of like the the typical way these things go. Uh, so. Uh, so we had to do it ourselves. We had to do it the hard way. Uh, so the question is, well, okay, how are you going to figure out which cities are doing online voting? There's 440 municipalities in Ontario. Um, and here's the problem. The first thing we had to do is actually create a list of all of these cities. Um, the Ontario government has a web page that you can go to that has the links to all of the Ontario municipalities in its jurisdiction, all 444. But in most cases, the URLs were outdated and broken. Um, you know, like Ontario doesn't even have a complete list of its own cities. Uh, back in the 90s, they used the form city.on.ca. Uh, today, they use the form, typically use the form uh, city.ca. Um, but they just never updated the website. So we had to go and for every city, first of all, just figure out what its actual URL was so that we could have a list to then later go to. 
Um, and then we, we found and reported those errors to uh, Municipal Affairs. Uh, they said, thank you, uh, we're on it. Um, but that was a year ago and they haven't fixed them. So uh, this is again typical of, of my experience. The next thing we had to do is figure out, figure out which cities worked with which vendors, right? So we needed to know which cities were actually doing online voting now that we actually knew which cities there were. Um, so w one of the things that, uh, that helped us was that um, the vendors, uh, for the most part, lumped all of, uh, the, all of their clients, all of the cities that are running online voting under single URL domains. Um, so it was either a subdomain or a subdirectory of a single domain. So we were able to use like regular expressions to kind of brute force, like do DNS brute forcing to find which cities had active websites. Um, and that gave us most of them, um, but some of them we actually didn't know the URL. So in, in the mind of the cities, uh, the URL is a secret in many cases that you shouldn't be uh, posting online because uh, bad actors overseas might uh, find out about the URL of your voting website and might try to attack it. So in many cases, the way that the, that the URL is communicated is through a, like a letter, like a snail mail letter to the voter. Um, so we didn't you know, we, we didn't live in every city, we didn't know people in every city, so we were initially thinking we were going to actually have to call every office, every municipal office, and ask them. Uh, but it, it, it turned out that we were actually able to get very far just by brute forcing DNS. Um, the ones that we couldn't find, uh, we were able to find them in the certificate transparency logs, uh, like Markham, uh, Ontario. Uh, they, they, did, they did this perfect job of never revealing it, and they weren't using the, the, the sort of the main vendors that the others were using. Um, and then, so then when we had a list of cities that were, that, that we knew were using online voting, because we found their online voting website login page, uh, then we did a manual search of all the remaining ones just to check we didn't miss anything. So we had to like actually pour through council minutes to sort of, to, you know, do, do like, you know, um, site-specific Google searching looking for any mention of online voting. So it was labor-intensive and, and uh, you know, we weren't happy about it, but there wasn't really any, any other way to do it because it wasn't being collected uh, and um, we wanted to be sure. Um, so then we discovered that just because there's a website doesn't mean an actual election was being run. So uh, in some cases, the vendors in anticipation of a contract would set up a website, but the uh, town is a small town and nobody wanted to run against the mayor, so the mayor's acclaimed. Uh, so there's actually no election that gets run. But there's a website for the election. Uh, so we had to kind of figure out which ones were, were th those were. Uh, and there, there, there wasn't many, there's like three or four. But you know, we wanted to get the numbers as, as accurate as we could. Um, and then we later on found out that, uh, that in some cases they were putting up websites, but then there was some contract negotiation and the city said, look, you know, no thanks, we're going to go with a different vendor. And then they just left the login page up in anticipation of servicing that election. So uh, our count was uh, initially inflated. And the only way we figured this out was that, you know, we've been invited to give numerous talks to the Association of Municipal Clerks. Uh, and um, and I had I had uh, put up the numbers, and then one of the clerks comes up afterwards and like this city did not use that vendor, and there's a whole backstory there. And so we were able to kind of you know very slowly through painful <laughs> like manual uh, and human verification uh, methods uh, get to I think about the closest number that we can possibly get to. Um, there might even be small errors in it still. It's very very difficult to eliminate them all. Um, and then there's the Association of Municipalities of Ontario that actually have population data for each of the cities that we were able to then uh, cross-reference with our own data to find out how many people were uh, uh, voting. Uh, well, we don't actually know because they don't publish how many people used which method. Uh, so we had to estimate based on turnout and our understanding of uh, what methods they were using. So here, here's the numbers. Um, so uh, this is sort of the, the pie chart uh, on the left of like by municipality and then on the right by total number of eligible voters. Um, you, you'll find that the population distribution of municipalities kind of follows a power log kind of um, uh, curve. So there's like, some, you know, this, the, this, the, um, I actually figured out the, 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 um, you. Oh, for electronic means internet here? Electronic uh, means um, either internet or um, uh, on um, uh, optical scan, okay. um, uh, so. Um, oh, sorry, no, 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 no. Um, uh, paper encompasses optical scan, 
uh, there's like a paper ballot. When I say electronic, uh, uh, rather, I mean online or telephone voting. So, so the cities that were using electronic balloting only uh, were ones that had only online voting, and typically they had telephone voting as a kind of a backup. Like, you know, you don't know how to vote online, that's fine, call or telephone, you know. If you so want, can it? Was using touch screen with no paper, but uh, you just uh, touch the name of the... Uh um, to get it's possible that 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 some were, uh, but we weren't aware of any. Um, so uh, but there there have I have been made aware of some municipalities in like Alberta that use touch screen, but it's not it's not a common uh, method for voting in in Ontario. So um, anyway, so uh, here we have one and a half million voters that only uh, could vote in an electronic medium, so uh, online or telephone. Um, and most of them used the online option uh, because uh, the telephone voting is, uh, that actually may be the worst form of voting, I'm not sure. It's a usability disaster. I mean, if you're an older person and you're sitting through a list of 20 candidates, if you want candidate one, press one. If you want candidate two, press two. I'm not gonna sit here and do the whole thing, but I'll do one. If you want candidate three, press three. And then all of a sudden, click, and you're like, what? Like, what happened? And the phone just hangs up, and you're like, that, like, that's messed up. And then you call them back and it says, thank you for voting. Your ballot has been recorded already. So we, we, we had a lot of anecdotal accounts of, of this kind of happening. So telephone voting is uh, not good, but I, I didn't focus on it because I feel that online voting is the greater threat. And so that's where we sort of... Put it. So anyway, so, so we, we estimated it was roughly two to four times the population uh, casting ballots online than Estonia did in their online uh, pa parliamentary elections. Okay. So, so we're doing it, and we're becoming world leaders in online voting. But I want to take a minute to talk about just the cyber maturity of these institutions. And it's, it's not that uh, some of this stuff is a direct threat to online voting, but what I do feel is that it illustrates the lack of um, awareness about cyber issues. Um, you, 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 know, you really need to learn to walk before you try to run. So um, we had an interesting sort of battle with Elections Canada to get them to turn on TLS on their website. Uh, it, was a, it, was almost, it took us almost a year. Um, and you know, we, we also had this battle with other election agencies, and they said, you know, yeah, you know, we don't need, as we heard this a lot, well, we don't actually need TLS on our website because we don't, um, we don't do online voting on the main website. So we don't need TLS, because uh, the only reason you need TLS is for forms. But we're like, well, you kind of need TLS for other stuff. I mean, TLS doesn't provide just privacy, but it also provides integrity and authentication. So, you know, you can, you can make things look different. And in fact, we actually had a problem with that. In Guelph, Ontario, we had a, um, an electronic, it was a telephone-based attack. Uh, it was a, the, they called it the robocall scandal, where um, auto dialers would call people and tell them to go to the wrong polling site. Um, so an electronic version of that is, you know, the, the classic man in the middle attack and, uh, you know, you, you go to look up where you're supposed to vote and it tells you some, someplace else. So you need TLS. There's a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, you know, it, it, like you guys all know this, but apparently no one else uh, knew this at the time. Okay. So Elections Canada, um, you know, I was emailing them and calling them and, and, and s sending them tweets and they said, yes, you know, we, we do understand the importance of HTTPS and we're working on it. Um, but don't worry, it's been implemented for all of the web forms, at least, that are collecting personal information. But that turned out to be incorrect. Uh, and, and they actually sent me this email after I already sent them this image. So I was starting to get really, really annoyed. Um, we also see this in leadership races. Uh, so here's, uh, this is the um, kind of the sort of more, like we actually have more than two parties in Canada. So this is the left uh, leaning party, the uh, uh, New Democratic Party. Uh, and so we saw many uh, examples where they were giving um, HTTP um, URLs. So um, typically what happens is that, uh, you know, your browser makes a, a request via HTTP, you know, on port 80, and then we get a response from the server saying, no, no, please, you know, please switch to HTTPS, and then a new request would be made on uh, 443. Uh, 
if you are a man in the middle, that is your opportunity to then do a man in the middle attack because the browser asked for an insecure resource. Uh, so when it gets one back, it doesn't suspect anything's wrong. Um, so we, you know, we've been trying to convince them to sort of be better, more hygienic about their links. Um, but you know, here's the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs uh, webpage. This is the minister that's o uh, that oversees the cities that do online voting, and so there's a. There's, they're, they're collecting inf personal information over HTTP. Here's the Federal Minister of Democratic Institutions uh, webpage, also over HTTP. Um, but uh, they're, they seem to be more interested in fighting um, uh, misinformation uh, than helping sort of deal with the online voting at, at the lower levels of government. Um, so uh, finally, we were able to get a little bit of uh, traction with this uh, when... Um, Ron Diebert of Citizen Lab uh, started noticing, and I, I started talking to him on Twitter, and his followers started helping me uh, get, uh, f finding out who within Elections Canada could finally deal with this. Uh, and then it ended up turning into a national news story. <laughs> so um, so the, the Liberal Party turned on their TLS really fast. Uh, Elections Canada less fast, but they did it. And it was like, you know, when, when I have to apply for my next grant and they say, what is your greatest contributions to research? Like, this is going on. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but this was like a big deal. Um, but we don't actually, even all of, the, so like, we've done a lot over the last couple of years to get election agencies just to recognize the most basic, most basic web security things you can do. But uh, Elections Yukon, as of today, is still not using HTTPS on their site. Uh, they've promised me, they promised me about six months ago that they were going to switch over, but they haven't still. So um, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I think, have a, um, a party the day that all election agencies in Canada are running HTTPS. Um, now, this is the website for the Northwest Territories. Now, um, yes, they are a small territory, but again, this is a big kind of historic election in Canada because we are uh, sort of breaking the seal, going up to the subnational level. Um, and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's worthwhile to sort of ask, like, what are they doing? Well, the first thing to appreciate is that the Northwest Territories has only had a, a public key certificate since August of last year. So they're pretty new to the game. This website is run by the vendor. So obviously it's not the same, but it's really up to the election officials to ask questions of the vendor and make sure that they're, you know, doing a good job. Uh, but when you've only used TLS for, you know, 13 months, uh, it, it might be difficult. You might not have the cyber, you know, maturity to ask some of the tough questions. Online voting is one of the greatest open problems in cybersecurity. Um, so what are they doing uh, on this website? Well, um, they're using a Let's Encrypt uh, certificate, which I guess I can't criticize them because I use a Let's Encrypt certificate on my personal website. So there you go. Uh, and they're running it on a DigitalOcean instance. Um, and again, maybe there's nothing wrong, but it, it is interesting to realize that, yes, for, the, for the low cost of $5, you too can run a public election, because uh, that's what we're talking about in infrastructure costs. Um, so, okay, let's talk about voter authentication. Um, what are we doing to authenticate uh, a voter when they uh, show up to vote? And the authentication properties are very different than an in-person uh, in -person, um, uh, in -person, uh, polling place. Uh, with an in-person polling place, you have to be there in person. You, you have to actually go to the church or the community center. Uh, obviously, in an online setting, you can log in from anywhere, which is both a bug and a feature. Um, depending on how you look at it. So it would be nice to have strong authentication, but here's what they're doing. Um, so all of the vendors that were active in the Ontario election were using um, some kind of pin that was mailed to voters in like a um, snail mail. So and voters this is, in Canada have a unique ID? Uh, no, we don't have national ID. Social security, what do you... Yeah, so we do have social security numbers, but, but we don't have a, we don't, well, I mean, <laughs> as secret as your birth date, like, so. Uh, we don't have a national identity card, uh, similar to the U.S., and, and the politics are such that it wouldn't make sense. It makes sense for Estonia. Estonia is a small country, uh, population-wise and geographically, and uh, they're, frankly, a more homogenous society. Uh, you know, in, in Canada, we have to have special provisions in the Constitution just for Quebec. 
So, you know, everyone does things a little bit differently in, in Canada and, and in the U.S. So it's uh, national level identity cards just not going to work. Uh, so this is how they've chose to do. I, I don't think this is the like. So in, before you authenticate, what uh, does the authority know about you? <clears throat> Uh, it depends. So in the case of the Ontario municipal elections where all of this online voting was happening, uh, it was the Municipal Property Owners Association that was creating the voters list. So if you were a property owner or a tenant, uh, you were on the voters list so you would get a one of these pins in the mail. Uh, now if you own multiple pieces of property, sometimes you get multiple credentials to vote. Uh, or in uh, at least one case, um, there was a dead dog who received a pin in the election. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't the high, I mean, you know, it's okay. Like <laughs> these things happen. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so, um, so, so the primary factor was a pin and the second factor, and I, I, I really, sh I'm, I shouldn't have called it a second factor. That's not really correct. It, they're both knowledge factors, right? They're, they're both. And so, so a pin is something, you know, and a date of birth is something, you know, the, the concept in their minds was, well, if someone got a hold of the envelope, and got your PIN, at least they wouldn't know your date of birth. Um, forgetting about the fact that the major threat actors in this case were your own family, so of course they would know both factor, or both, both pieces of uh, ID. So this is kind of what the, uh, the letter would look like. You would have a PIN in the corner, and then of course they would uh, you know, invariably direct you to visit the website uh, without explicitly mentioning HTTPS. Um, and they, none of them use HSTS preloading, so uh, if you type that into the browser, you will uh, be man in the middle of a bull. Um, this is what the login page kind of roughly looks like. So you type in your PIN, type in your date of birth, and, and maybe solve a, a CAPTCHA or 10. Uh, I know that, uh, that uh, you know, people were saying that, that you know, under certain circumstances, they were being asked to solve like 10 CAPTCHAs. So imagine that. Like, I mean, I, I, I don't know if there's a constitutional issue with having to solve 10 CAPTCHAs in order to be able to vote. I think that the history of the United States suggests that there might be. So I don't know. Um, so here's the, the mapping between addresses and this pin that uh, all the people who are uh, registered in the same building are not getting uh, consecutive pins or anything else. Um, well, we, we would like to be able to do um, things like that, but it uh, unfortunately is a crime to show your pin to someone. Um, so we couldn't ethically, you know, just on, on inside the bat, like, we, you know, we, there's not a lot we could do as white hat researchers. I live in London, Ontario. Uh, they don't. They, they don't. They they use optical scan voting. So I was not eligible to vote in any of these online um, on the online elections, and we actually didn't know anyone in any of the towns that had a technical background enough to do a web proxy uh, to actually look at and analyze their own um, post HTTP posting um, that that occurred between their machine and the website. Um, so we were kind of stuck. Uh, so we did a lot of sort of like we we kind of the the. The, the, the study we did was entirely of public view information. So that, that's, that's frustrating. And of course, they don't have a spec. There's no like internals that we could look at. Uh, there was really, so you know, there's no demo system that we could play with. Um, they, none of that was made available. So, um, so here is the pin mailers. Um, and if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, uh, this is, I should have made it smaller. But uh, if you hold up the envelope to the light, you can, you can read it through the envelope. Um, Nobody ever apparently has heard of Heidelam. Nobody has ever thought that this might be a problem. Uh, I showed this to, to the clerks, and they were kind of like, oh, huh. Uh, well. <laughs> okay, so there's the dead dog. Okay, so, but here's the problem. You have, you have weak authentication. This happens. Okay, so there's an RCMP investigation. That's like the Canadian FBI investigation into allegations of voter fraud in Alberta uh, in the... Uh, United Conservative Party's leadership race. Okay, so Alberta's, um, uh, the, you know, the UCP is, is think of it as like, like state level Republicans um, having a having a, a, like a vote for the governor. Uh, so the so the premier of Alberta would be like the governor of a state. By the way, before mm -hmm. we proceed, just a short story about uh, those concealed numbers. Mm -hmm. So in France, they had a the, uh, kind of lottery system in which uh, they would give the store owner a number of uh, cards uh, with, uh, it looks like a, you know, a smart card, but uh, just has a pin covered uh, by uh, some kind of uh, silvery... Uh, Scratch off, yes. And uh, uh, the store owner will get, uh, I don't know, several hundred of them. Yeah. And of course, he would like to know uh, what's the number underneath. 
And uh, they developed a special technique in which you just use a pin to probe a small number of points. Right. And uh, this will uniquely identify what are the digits underneath. <laughs> yes, I, I remember. Uh, Not be visible at all. Yes, Ron actually told me that story uh, once. And, uh, and, and, and yes, it's this, I mean, and of course, like, so I, 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 I've lived uh, in Germany in the 80s. And so I know all about how the, uh, the, the advances in steaming open envelopes, uh, you know. So. Uh, existed so uh, well. Okay, to be fair, it was West Germany, so maybe they didn't do that. So okay, all right. So um, the United Conservative Party uh, has um, uh, has this 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 voter fraud scandal. So l let's look at how it's alleged to have happened. So um, in the U.S., uh, you typically will uh, affiliate yourself with a party uh, in order to be allowed to vote in the primary, right? So, you know, if you go and you look at these voter registries, um, it'll have a, a party affiliation with it. it. It seems very weird to me that you would publicly declare a party affiliation that's downloadable in a giant CSV, but that's how they, they roll in the U.S. In Canada, um, if you want to vote for uh, a leader in a primary race, you actually have to join the party. You pay your $10, you get your little card, and now you're a member of the party, but there's no, th there's not really... The reason why you declare your affiliation in the U.S. is so that you can't double dip. You can't be a Democrat uh, voter and a Republican voter at the same time. Uh, we don't really have that check uh, so much uh, in Canada, but that's, that's beside the point. The idea is that uh, when there's a leadership race, uh, the campaigners for the candidates go out and they try to get people to sign up and pay their 10 bucks. Um, and so they, they actively go out and try to you know, convince people to join the party. Um, so, uh, so there'll be some intermediary that will sort of sign you up, some kind of like sales representative for the party. So uh, you'll have a membership form where you'll fill out a bunch of information, including your name and your address and uh, you know, your email address. And then the campaigner would submit that to the party. The party would get all the memberships uh, applications together, have their big uh, database of party members. And then when it's time to vote, they're going to email everyone the login credential. So in this case, the login credential was an, a PIN, just a PIN, and it was emailed uh, to all of the party members. So the attack worked like this. Um, just replace the email address with the attacker's attacker-controlled email address, submit that membership form, and then the email login credential will go to the attacker instead. Now, um, this isn't a very sophisticated attack, and it's not very clever either, because this person's going to notice that they never got their PIN. Um, now, you might be, you, you might say, well, maybe, so this, okay, so first of all, this actually happened. Uh, people were missing their PINs. And when they went to look at the membership records of these people, they found that the email address listed on the membership application was different than the one that the, the, pers like the voter said. They're like, that's not my email address. I don't recognize that email address. So what are these email addresses? What, what, you know, do, are they just some random Hotmail accounts, or what are they? Well, um, one of the email addresses that was used uh, was for a domain called Jarring Mail. And uh, I went and looked at the certificate transparency logs, and it was bundled up with all of these other subject alternative names. Um, one of which up here was this, this is the name of somebody who ran in that election. So that's not proof, that's not proof of, that's not proof of anything per se, but what it's proof of is that the, these, these email addresses that were being alleged to have stolen votes were not just random email addresses. They were definitely linked with the election itself. Um, so I don't know what that means, but it, it's certainly, you know, maybe evidence of something. So all these domains are registered by the same entity. Yeah, so the same entity would uh, get a certificate issued, uh, and they're, they're let's increase. So, so uh, Did you check the, the register data? Yeah, the register. So it's, it's uh, one of these um, web hosting companies in the U.S., okay. uh, and you, you, of course, you can't go to the U U.S. company and say, hey, tell me who Give these me, people yeah. are. Uh, I, I don't even know if the RCMP can do that. Um, so, uh, but, but if they are, they're, they're certainly going to try to do that. Um, so anyway, so there was a whole bunch of these certificates that look like this, and it kind of, you know, gives you some sort of insight into what's going on. Uh, this, this is just one of, like, hundreds of these, um, the, these, these like, weirdly bundled uh, certificates. So something, something was afoot, let's just say that. 
Um, so I, I, you know, like like everything that happens, uh, I get a call from CBC News, and they say, "Well, can you can you uh, respond to this?" And so I say, "Okay, uh, here's an idea. Maybe don't use online voting, uh, but if you're going to do it, maybe don't just email uh, email uh, the, the the credential to the voter. Uh, that's not very secure." Um, and so the company, the CEO of the company that, that, um, that ran the election in Televote, uh, their, his point was, well, uh, you know, just if you want to add another layer of security, why don't you also require a birth date? Uh, with the premise being that, um, that the owner of this email address is not going to know your birth date, uh, assuming that it's not on the membership application that you filled out. I, I, I don't know. I'm not a member of the Alberta United Conservative Party, so I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, okay, so this is sort of the like view in Canada. Well, you know, just, you know, yeah, use a date of birth. That's going to that's gonna add security. So, okay, how much security does a date of birth add? Well, let's talk, first of all, let's talk about ballot secrecy. Um, so here's, uh, here's something from a company called um, Simply Voting. Yeah. Before you move on, can I just ask you a question? That <clears throat> I think it's generally known that you shouldn't email passwords, but they called it a PIN. Do you think if they had called it a password, more red flags would have sort of popped up in their minds that, like, yeah. oh, we shouldn't email passwords? Yeah, yeah. The uh, word PIN somehow obscures it, makes it sound. Yeah, I, I think that's a. I think that's a fair point. Um, we all wrestle with our mental models. Um, we all need to have a robust mental model of of a technological process. Um, but we do naturally, as, as uh, humans, abstract uh, things out. Uh, that's why we talk about clouds, you know. And, and, and when you talk to um, non-technical people about clouds, you know, you have to say to them, "Look, it's not actually a cloud. <laughs> okay, it's, you know, there's there's a server somewhere, and your data is on that server. So here's a question: Where is that server? And typically, like when I talk to election officials, I'm like, "Where's your server?" And they're like. Like it's in Toronto. I'm like, yeah, but where? And they're like, well, I, I don't know. Somebody knows. And it's like, well, okay. Um, is it, is it question? Yeah. How difficult is it to get uh, some of these uh, birth dates? It's because not. Because there not. are, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of uh, uh, people who had their personal details stolen. And yes. Posted, uh, so. So date of birth, date of birth in in the United States is ridiculous. Like so, date, dates of birth are published freely in voter registries in the United States. So um, so for this study, we used the Ohio voter registry, giant CSV file. Uh, we downloaded it. It's just freely available. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to do anything. It's like a gigabyte. It's got eight million, nine nine million records in it, and they all. It's like everyone's name and address, and date of birth, and sex. And uh, you, you know what di jurisdiction they're in, and so forth, and it's just freely available online. But in Canada, that's not ostensibly uh, immediately available. Although I, I was in an argument with um, uh, I was in an argument with one CEO of of a company about this, and then I went and, and found the date of birth of one of their employees on a fitness blog that they had written and sort of you know, said, look, it's not that secret. So, uh, But let's pretend for the moment that it is secret, that it's a good secret, that it can be changed uh, if it's leaked. And so, um, so let's just look briefly about secrecy. So uh, Simply Voting, they're the ones running uh, this new, uh, Northwest Territories election. Uh, Here's a document that they put out that I found very frustrating. Uh, they, they claim that it is impossible for municipal staff or simply voting employees to see how you voted. Now, I think they should be careful saying the word impossible in cybersecurity, and I think it's going to, you know, it's the famous last words, let's just say that. Um, so, okay, so here's, here's some samples of a high home voter registry. It's not very impossible to get uh, the identities of these people with their dates of birth. A uh, date of birth has um, in the higher voter registry, you're looking at like 2 to the 15 unique dates of birth, roughly. Um, and there's about f only 14 bits of Shannon entropy. So as a password, they're, they're not that good. It's about like roughly about what you could get out of a four-digit pin or a two-character password. Okay, so just as a, as a password, it's not very good. Uh, but what about for privacy? Okay, well, here's the point. In a single web session... The election server sees the jurisdiction that you live in, because that's part of the URL that you use to sign in. They see the date of birth, because that's a login credential. And then they see your ballot selections, because that gets posted to uh, the web server. And if you think that it's encrypted, it's not. OK, so here you go. This is, this is my like, Charles proxy uh, capture here of, of um, what, uh, what, what, what it might look like. 
Um, this, is, this is just for one particular vendor. Um, okay, so the question is, um, can you use these two pieces of information to uniquely identify somebody uh, and therefore link them with their uh, cast ballot preference? Um, so the question is, how unique is your date of birth combined with the jurisdiction you live in, which in, in the Ontario voting case was, how, you know, are you the only person in your small town that has your date of birth? And the answer is, well, yes, most of the time. So uh, um, out, of, out of all of these eligible voters, uh, we ran a simulation using the Ohio uh, registry. Again, we don't have the Ontario. We pretended the Ohioans were Ontarians for, for the, the day. Uh, and, um, and we used the Ontario population data to simulate uh, with the Ohio uh, dates of birth. And we found that in, um, uh, in, in roughly half of the cases, you're actually unique. Uh, so in all of the towns that were running online voting, on average, half of the people had a unique date of birth. So, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, so, you know, or, or you know, with 90%, you're, you're down to, like, within five people. So if, if, uh, if you know anything about HIPAA, uh, K equals 5 is not okay. Uh, K equals 1 is definitely not okay, but K equals 5 is not even, even that's okay. Um, so even if you go up to K equals 10, you know, you're, you're up in, well into the 90s. So um, where was the privacy risk assessment uh, of this? Uh, the answer is, well, I don't think that they even considered that that was something that needed to, to be done. So, uh, in conclusion to this, um, you know, dates of birth are just, they're, they're just no good as passwords. And, uh, like, our, our point is they can leave, lead to re-identification that would allow the linking of voters to voter identities with votes. Um, now, we actually suspect it's much worse than this. We actually suspect the vendors have a very direct way to link voters to votes, but we can't. We can't prove it because we don't know exactly what they do, but at least we can prove through, um, through the date of birth uh, field that it, uh, uh, it's, it's certainly more than possible. So one approach to do it is uh, to have some kind of dictionary which uh, con connects the PIN to the identity of the person. Uh, how the PIN was generated by the company, right? The, the unique PIN... No, there was a, uh, well, so we actually, I actually don't know. I can't seem to get an answer on that. There's a third party uh, company that, that does the mailings, and I believe that they would have uh, generated the pins, but it's like, it's, it's not clear what they do, and we can't seem to find out. So, I mean, I, uh, you know. Did you get the sample of those things just to check if they're, they're sequential or if, if they look like kind of randomly generated? So again, we did not uh, get any of the pins uh, because it would have been illegal for us oh. to, to, to even look at a voter's pin. Uh, that would, that, I mean, we'd be contravening some kind of like law or bylaw or something. And, you know, we just ethically couldn't uh, do that. Um, so, uh, but, that, but yeah, I, I, so to your question, are the pins randomly generated or are they generated according to some sequence? I think that we have every reason to believe that there's a sequence there, but uh, you know who knows. They're probably deterministically generated from dates of birth. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The pin is the date. Yeah. So, um, okay. So here's another one. I'm running out of time, so I want to speed this up. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so the election was in October, and so about April, um, CBC came and they asked. They said, "Okay, well, what's on your mind with this election? Like, what's what's the problem?" And um, there were a lot of problems, but the one I was thinking about that day was about disaster preparedness, about disaster plans. I was online looking at municipal documents. We looked at so many municipal documents, and uh, it's, it's a weird world, uh, municipal politics. I, I've been very fascinated by it. It's, it's, got, it's got some charm. I've gone to a bunch of council meetings. And, but one thing that we could never find was what happens if the online voting system goes offline? Like, let's just say that that happens, right? It's an online system. Sometimes they go down. And, uh, you know, what do you do? And the answer is, well, I, I don't know. I couldn't find any evidence that they had even thought about it. Um, so I pointed that out in, in this, this interview, and uh, they went and they asked a couple of municipal clerks, like, so, you know, what is your disaster plan? What are you going to do if something happens? And one clerk said, well, I don't have a disaster plan. I'm going to have to ask my vendor, because the municipal clerks, uh, many of them are very reliant on their vendor for all cybersecurity matters. Uh, they're not talking to anyone else. Uh, there's certainly no standards or, or EAC to help them. Um, so another one said, uh, I love this one, uh, we're hoping nothing does happen. Uh, but something did happen. Uh, on the night of the election, uh, Dominion's um, 
uh, uh, online systems, uh, which, which accounted for um, um, uh, just, just under 50 municipalities, uh, for, uh, accounting for almost a million voters, uh, went offline. Um, it didn't exactly go offline, it just ground to a halt. Uh, and I actually was uh, looking at, at, like, as it was happening, we were kind of like, hey, what's something, something's going on here. We noticed that, uh, so all of the statically served content coming out of Cloudflare, that was, that was fine. That was, that was serving up just like normal, but all the dynamic content that would be hitting the backend server was just like, you know, just spinning, 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 voting. Uh, the, the loads would time out. Uh, so basically, people weren't able to cast a ballot, uh, and it was at the worst worst time possible, which was like the night of the election after supper. There's um, no evidence of denial of service. Uh, well, we, well, so they did. It was a denial of service because they weren't able to vote. But uh, it turns out that it was a self-own. Uh, it, it was a uh, they denial of service, uh, sort of essentially denial of service themselves. Um, in particular, uh, they blamed their um, co-location provider for placing a bandwidth restriction that was one-tenth of what had been agreed uh, upon. Okay, so uh, here is a case where, um, uh, you know, million, like a million, potentially up to a million people uh, weren't able to vote. Um, and so, okay, here's a question. Why? Why did that happen? Why did they have a miscommunication? First of all, which of the cities were the ones affected? 51 municipalities, you say. Which, which are the municipalities? Well, you know, too, too bad. We're not going to tell you. Uh, one of my colleagues actually asked Dominion to tell her the cities that, that they, were, they were partnered with for an, a different study that she did, and they wouldn't tell her. Uh, I actually spoke to Dominion reps and asked them, well, you know, who is the co-location provider? What, what's their name? Um, why, wh um, wh why, why did you have this... Um, why did you have this bandwidth restriction? And they, they wouldn't tell me either, which was frustrating because that information actually uh, was public. Uh, I found it buried in a staff report uh, for the city of Sudbury. It was a miscommunication. Oh, so. one side using the trick, the other was using a career? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it was more, it was more like well, logarithmic. Uh, one, one side believed that, that the other was going to do 10 times what they actually did. Um, so the bandwidth requested was one uh, gigabit per second. Uh, but it was uh, understood by the service provider to be the upper potential bandwidth, not the continuous bandwidth. Uh, during the slowdown, this, the bandwidth was actually set to only 100 megabits per second, um, which was uh, half of what was expected. Um, so so uh, the cities that were affected, um, what, okay, so you're an election official and your voting website's offline on election night. What do you do? Uh, well, first of all, you try not to panic, and you, they, they all kind of got on a conference call with each other, and they finally figured out, Dominion was able to, you know, fairly quickly figure out what happened. But, you know, it had already been like, a, a, you know, an hour before the service was, was restored. So what do you do? Well, um, many of them did, um, so, so they had to, first of all, they had to invoke an emergency clause under the Municipal Elections Act to extend the voting period. Um, and, and most of them actually ended up doing a 24-hour extension. So we just make the election... A day longer. Now, obviously, there's the results were in before people. Uh, they, they, no, 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 they, they, no, no, they weren't. They weren't reporting results yet, um, oh, uh, thankfully. But the people that had voted, uh, thinking that it was the, the election night, now had suddenly had an extra day of campaigning to potentially change their mind. So, I, I don't know. Um, th this is not. This is not good. But it kind of. It sort of. It sort of squeaked through. Okay, uh, client-side security. Okay, so I wanna, um, we're getting close to the end here, so I just wanna show you something. Um, so CBC came to me and they, they said, look, what, what do you think about Northwest Territories? And I said, oh, I could tell you all kinds of stuff, but uh, that day I was thinking about client-side security, so I said, okay, um, well, we have this browser extension plugin to swap your vote. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, yeah, so uh, I'll show you what I mean. Um, and they said, well, have you reported this vulnerability to the vendor? And we said, well, no, it's not a vulnerability. It's a browser extension. It's designed to modify the DOM to look whatever, whatever you want. And so, uh, so then I ended up going on the, the, C the CBC national news to, to talk about this. And uh, it, it was great because the, um, the, the vendor uh, uh, said, well, you know, creating a browser extension that like swaps votes would actually be very difficult to do. And besides, uh, you'd have to basically be the KGB or the CIA. Uh, I don't know if they know that the KGB didn't exist kind of concurrently with the internet. Um, 
uh, you know, to, to, in order to affect hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, the other point is, is that the Northwest Territories has little victory margin. Some ridings had in the last election had margins of like um, under under uh, 20 uh, people. So um, my my goal as a threat actor is not to change hundreds of thousands of votes, but potentially as, as low as 10. OK, so just just to, I mean, like you, you guys all appreciate this, but what you need to appreciate is that they don't appreciate this. OK, so here's the demo website for uh, Simply Voting. This is actually the live website. This is a live website. Yeah, so you can try it out, demo.simplyvoting.com. Um, and, you, you know, this is nothing this is nothing like that simply voting is doing that's unusual or, <coughs> or, or, or different uh, than any of the other vendors. I'm not trying to single them out uh, relative to anyone else, but I think this is an important point. So um, let's say that you know, this, is, this is the actual candidates for the election, um, but if I have a browser, um, a browser plugin uh, that uh, is designed to do something, and okay, we can talk about how that browser plugin gets on your computer in a, in a different conversation, but uh, I, I think the point is, is that you can change the DOM to look like anything that you want. Okay, so you know, like now we're voting for the ACM president. I think Vanessa is a good candidate for that, so I'll vote for her. Now, here's a question: Do you think online voting, in light of this, is secure? Well, I would claim no, but oh, you never know. I saw that on a video just yesterday. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Um, all right, but then you see, you know, it got it got changed uh, back to me after all. So this is the point that that I know that I know that any technical audience would appreciate, but. It's it, like it's astonishing to realize how 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 that knowledge doesn't extend very far beyond these walls. Uh, that what you see on this web page and what is communicated to the server are they could be totally independent. And there's no way for the I mean, unless you're some kind of web proxy uh, person who can who can set up uh, you know set up. Um, uh, one of these web proxies to actually look, you're not going to know what actually gets sent to the server. So if you have a malicious client, uh, it, you know, you're going to have a problem. Now, uh, I w like I had wanted to show uh, this, this, uh, this piece of hardware we have. Um, y y there's lots of ways that you could get an extension on there. I think everyone's probably aware of it. But one kind of fun way is uh, this is um, a, it's called a USB rubber ducky. It's a mechanical keyboard. And what you do is uh, you program it to um, do a sequence of keystrokes. Uh, so you, you walk up to a computer and you plug it in, um, and it will just type things. And so you can actually install these uh, browser plugins just through a sequence of keystrokes. And so, so we've done that. Now, I think everyone in this room understands that if you have physical access to a machine, you can do whatever you want. That's not the point. Okay, uh, we, we all know that a human being is capable of you know Turing complete behavior, and uh, you know, but yet and yet we don't. Uh, want to have complicated uh, voting at the polls. It's, it's, it's about what's easy to do. So I could create these and give them to people who can then walk around. They have these computers at the mall uh, and voting help stations. You know, don't know how to vote online? Come down to the mall and we'll show you. So I walk up to one of these stations and I get chatting with the person and say, hey, look over there. I put this in. This is about realizing, it's <laughs> essentially, you know, democratizing hacking elections, if you will. <laughs> so. Uh, to use the uh, first stage in which uh, you register uh, with a particular party. You said before that uh, operators are uh, asking people to join parties. So party A, mm -hmm. party A's computer has to be infected mm -hmm. so that everyone who registers to it is automatically getting the malware that is going to switch the vote uh, to party number two. You see, um, those who register for party one, right. while registering, because they are communicating with an infected machine, one infected machine will get yeah. its browser extension. Yeah, I mean, so, so that, that is a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. That, 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 I mean, you know, the, the whole, uh, wholesale attacks like that are, are certainly possible. But I mean, that sounds something more like at the KGB's level of cyber sophistication. You know, so, uh, not at my level. Uh, I'm, not a cyber, yeah, I'm not a cyber operations expert. But I can build one of these, and I can put it onto your computer if you leave me alone with it. OK, so I think that's just the point that I wanted to make there. And that point is just not really being understood, uh, not being really heard, let's just say. I think that his suggestion is really practical because you have to click on links when you register, and that's it. That's all you need. Well, no, you, you, well, okay, but you still have to like accept the browser uh, plugin. The server is yeah. infected. That's the help part. Yes. Yeah, so, so the that's server is infected, and then you know the, the user has to click on links and accept. 
Except what? Uh, but, but, and, and, and you can exploit that, I mean. Well, so, I mean, JavaScript is sandboxed, yeah. so you, you have to break out of that sandbox or, or fish them or, or socially engineer them into <laughs> installing the yes. plugin. Uh, the, these or things are absolutely possible. Yeah. But uh, like we, our 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 question was, what is the like the dumbest way and the simplest way to do it? Uh, so actually, what, what what we just do is we just swap the candidates uh, in the DOM yeah. in text. So the the thing that's being submitted, see, like when when Vanessa and I were working on Ivo trying to reverse engineer it, it was a big spaghetti. Um, and so it was like a real, real hassle to sort of figure out what they're doing. You know, uh, we hash it, then we base 64 decode it, then we hash that, then we base 64 decode that, then we hash that. And you don't have to do this here. All you have to do is take the text, and every time you see candidate A, you swap it for candidate B in the in the in the DOM. Uh, so it's it's extremely simple. Um, but I mean, yes, let your imaginations run wild. Uh, client side security is almost entirely overlooked uh, in online voting. Uh, so. And if you are like a state actor and you want to you know, compromise an election, the social engineering in this case becomes really easy because the person is already engaged in this activity of registering for himself yeah, or herself. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, um, so the last thing I want to talk about, and this one, as far as I'm concerned, is the worst. Uh, it's the worst of, of all, and that is the, the lack of results transparency. So, you know, sort of just at a broad level, you have voters that are casting ballots through some kind of cloud infrastructure to an election server. The election official gets the vote totals by logging into the like admin page of the vendor. So the election official just sort of sees a bunch of numbers that are being presented to them. There's no auditing here. I mean, okay, there is auditing. Uh, they, they do this, uh, they, they have somebody that they choose to do logic and accuracy testing, but, but the, the public and the candidates don't really get to interact uh, or, or be a part of that. So from the voter's perspective, you know, this is kind of what the, the process looks like. And remember, uh, that goes all the way up to the voter's fingertips, right? Because we don't know what the client's necessarily doing. I mean, there are ways to find out, but you have to be technologically sophisticated to a degree that, I mean, you're, you're talking about like people, like you, you don't realize how few people can do uh, simple things to, to us that might be simple, like setting up a web proxy. I mean, it's probably like less than one in a thousand of the population that, that would, would be able to do it or, or think to do it. So this is what you see as the voter, the just numbers coming out of a black box that don't really have any, anything to support them beyond just the trust that you might have in the system. But should you trust the system? Well, here's the thing that we're missing in Canada. Everyone's so focused on foreign threats, you know, disinformation, you know, the Russians are going to hack us, that they never stop to consider. This is from a NIST document, and so I've been trying to get the Canadians to appreciate that, you know, at least in other countries, they've become sophisticated enough to realize that the voting system manufacturers themselves might, might, in certain circumstances, act in a malicious fashion. Um, not that they would. Not that they would. They might be hacked. They might be hacked. You know, it's not that they would. Uh, uh, knowingly do this, but that they could, and that we need to account for that. I, the I machines said, uh, might be made in China, China exactly. mm -hmm. and uh, it's supply chain, I think. Uh, again, these things are all possible, but honestly, I think that the, the real risk that people are worried about in Canada, um, so I, I actually had a lot of conversations with candidates who lost the election unexpectedly, and they came to me and they said, look, I, I don't think that, I think something went wrong, and I, I'm trying to prove it, and they can't prove it because they can't get the information from the vendors. Um, and so without anything to help them understand what happened, that's when the conspiracy theories start. And I don't have anything to dull those conspiracy theories. Um, so, and, and just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you, okay? That's the other thing to appreciate. So now we're starting to see lawsuits cropping up, uh, challenging election results. Um, it's, it's going to get worse. Um, and so, you know, like where is anything to convince the people that lost. That's really, I mean, so forget about the, you know, forget about the Russians for a second. Um, the people who lose unexpectedly are going to eventually, I mean, uh, you know, so I, I actually talked to a deputy mayor. I was setting up my Christmas tree and she called and she said, listen, you know, I, I, I just, I, I think, I think there was some fraud that happened, but I can't prove it. And I said, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you go to the press? Why don't you do this? And she's like, I just feel like if I did that, it would be perceived in a bad way and I don't want to cause a ruckus. And then I talked to another mayor of Ontario who, who lost in the, in the election and he said, you know, he, he just feels like the Canadians are just too, too polite to 
you know, sort of, you know, like, I, I think the election was hacked. <laughs> so, uh, but that's not going to last forever, and it certainly is not going to be a problem that the Americans are going to experience that shyness over, like, I, I, the election is stolen. So, the lesson that I want to leave you with here is just that, to me, after spending all this time looking at online voting, the, you know, the, the, the real threat is not bad tech, it's not the Russians, it's um, w what you might consider normalcy bias. Just our, our unwillingness to prepare for disasters that have not happened yet, our unwillingness to uh, consider that things can go wrong or that things have gone wrong. Um, and so for a company here that is kind of embarking on a, a journey into elections, uh, I, I, I think that uh, having the best technology uh, is not going to necessarily be the winning uh, a success condition. Um, it's, it's, you kind of have to solve the Cassandra problem, right? So Cassandra, you know, famously the, 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 the myth that uh, she could see the future, but nobody would believe her. So, you know, that, that's, that's really what we have to, what we have to do here. So, um, okay. Thanks uh, guys. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to, if you want to see more about kind of what I've been doing, you can go check me out on Twitter. And um, if you have any questions now, I don't know if we have time. Some questions. Yeah, we, have, we have time for a few questions. Yeah. So the, the people that were, the lawsuit that you showed, on what basis was it because there was sort of a mismatch between polls and results? Or what, what caused them to think that there was a problem? So I, I actually, uh, I was actually asked to, to be an expert witness in that, uh, in that case. And it's, it's still ongoing right now. The judge is uh, still ruling on it. But um, they, um, they try, see, there's a real, there's a real difference between uh, the world that we live in, uh, the world of technology that we live in, and the, and the legal world. They're almost, they're not even like different planets, they're like different dimensions. So when you see something like online voting and there's like a serious technical argument to be made about the, like, the, the implications for democracy, but you don't have a lot of past legal rulings on it, it's like a fresh legal topic, you often can't use the technology argument head on. You actually have to kind of attack it from sort of surrounding issues like you know procedural issues that weren't followed and so forth. Even though the core of the complaint is the online voting itself, uh, it's it's sort of being uh, pursued in a legal avenue through sort of indirect uh, means, and so that's kind of what what is the substance of that lawsuit. But it's ultimately about citizens uh, in that town uh, having serious concerns about online voting and the use of it. Uh, and the lack of transparency and the lack of cyber maturity and preparedness and uh, ballot secrecy and so forth. Um, one uh, person was uh, hoping to make the argument that, um, that, that the ballot secrecy that they felt was very low uh, would be a reason that they would feel that out of need to protect their own information, that they wouldn't vote in the election and, and were disenfranchised for it. Uh, but unfortunately, municipal elections are not protected by the Constitution of Canada, so we weren't able to sort of uh, go that way. But um, this is something that has floated under the radar, floated under the news cycle, uh, not entirely, obviously. Uh, but um, we are at the beginning of, of this. It's going to it's going to get worse. And if the U.S. Uh, decides to go down this road, then you're going to have to confront all this as well. So I'll, I'll ask for an opinion if nobody else is asking. Um, can you offer your, your view on whether online voting can be done better than it's currently being done in Ontario, Canada, and can it be done well enough to be adequately secure? Can it be done better? Yes, it can be done better. That's actually very easy because it's being done so badly right now uh, that anything really is, 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 is better. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to city, city clerks and said, okay, well, what about, uh, you know, what about your... Um, what about your penetration test? They, they, they would say, listen, uh, we've hired a penetration testing firm and we're satisfied with the security of our system. Okay, forgetting about the fact that penetration testing does nothing to convince voters that their vote counted, um, uh, I, I would say to them things like, well, you know, that's great, do a penetration test. Can I see the report? And they say, oh, no, no, we don't, we don't make that report public. So, you know, they, they, they really have to understand that um, as uh, people become more aware of the technology that's being used to count their votes, they are going to have more questions about how it works. Uh, that's actually a quote from uh, the Chief Electoral Officer of Ontario, um, sort of like laying out essentially a, like a kind of a coming storm 
uh, that, that I would see. So um, I think that as that storm kind of gathers, um, these things will start to work. But I mean, we don't even know exactly how to do online voting, uh, except for perhaps cryptographic end-to-end uh, -end verification, um, how to do it well. There's no risk-limiting audits for online voting. Not that risk-limiting audits are the greatest thing ever either, but. Just one quick remark. I, mean, I think if you depend solely on, on a browser, you know, things are, things are true. I mean, this is the worst, like, you yeah. know, like, it's way worse than Brazil. I mean, the, the fact that there is no way you can verify there is this black box, this is already no go. But, um, I think you know, we could exploit the fact that we have more than one computing device with us nowadays. You know, you have a cell phone, you have a computer, and you can use you know, those devices to check you know, for the authenticity of the web page, whatever, so that you have to compromise those devices simultaneously. And, and uh, um, it, it, if you depend solely on a browser, you know, things are pretty... Yeah, so, okay, yeah, you can have, uh, you can have multiple devices, uh, but, uh, you know, voting also has this character of, like, you know, I, I had... I had uh, People, can, candidates coming to me, telling me about uh, it, it, situations where, you know, especially like older uh, older people in retirement homes, um, they they would not know how, like, they would not have the ability to yeah. even like sign into one of these. Um, where is this here? Okay, so any. Oh, okay, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I missed it. Um, any of these like login pages that we use 10 times a day, uh, they've never used. And signing in was even like just a insurmountable challenge for them. So then we heard anecdotal accounts of like candidates who would go to these homes and, and, and you know, these are small towns, right? So everyone knows everyone and they're like, oh, Bob, like here's, you know, let me help you log in. So first you're gonna like type in your, your pin. Oh, you don't know how to do it, let me help you, okay. And then you're gonna click a vote for me, right? Because the, the person ostensibly said, yeah, I wanna vote for you, help, help me vote for you. And uh, in many cases, you know, these candidates, like they're, you know, they're not trying to do over-the-shoulder coercion, although that's effectively what they're doing. It's it's all well meant, but uh, the technological sophistication is, is is not there. So, saying, okay, we're all going to have two devices, um, you know, that, then you, you're going to get into this issue of like, well, what if you have no devices? Um, you know, so. You know, maybe you could go vote at the library and well, the library exactly. computer. You know, it's, system, it's usually paper-based. So depending on the election, I mean, so if it's a municipal election and it's not guaranteed by the Constitution, maybe you can get away with that. But if it's a federal election and it is guaranteed by the Constitution, you can't be saying that the only people that can vote have to have phones, um, which is, I, I, I mean, I think it makes sense to everyone, but this is sort of some of the stuff we're grappling with. You know, you have to have an internet connection to vote. So, yeah. Please, you mentioned hand-marked paper ballots as your preferred mechanism. How do you address the accessibility limitations of hand-marked paper ballots and how does that when you start right. introducing like so, so the, the, the major limitation of handmarked paper ballots is, is accessibility. I mean, it's not like paper ballots are the ultimate uh, insecurity. It's just that whatever you're, like, we all started with handmarked paper ballots and hand-counted paper ballots. Even the U.S. did it for, for a while back in the day. The issue is if you're going to move away from what you have, it better not be worse than what you have. Um, now, from an accessibility standpoint, yeah, that's, that's absolutely uh, an issue. The way that Canada deals with it is different because we don't have the same have a requirements about accessibility. So in Canada, they'll, they'll do things like they'll say, you can bring a, an assistant to help you vote, which is a politically not a non-starter in the U.S. It should be like the, the, there's an understanding that uh, people with disabilities have, have a right to vote unassisted. And that right doesn't, I, I don't know if it exists, but it's certainly not uh, guaranteed in, uh, um, in Canada right now. So it, 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 it allows that form of voting to be possible. So uh, it, you'll find that, that the ground like laws uh, of your country will define uh, what's possible um, in terms of, of voting. And, and it sort of it creates the sort of initial conditions for the evolution. So. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, question about the infrastructure that these vendors are using. You made a, a quip earlier that, you know, oh, for $5, you know, uh, you could grab a DigitalOcean instance and a Let's Encrypt certificate. Um, That's right. Uh, on the other hand, these people who went with, you know, some fancier thing at a co-location place uh, seem to have sort of messed up quite egregiously. So uh, when, when uh, you know, municipalities are deciding between vendors should they go with ones that are, you know, sort of using, you know, more proven infrastructure, whether it's like a well-known public cloud uh, or, you know, they're 
running their own servers and then don't have a backup plan? Like, what, yeah. what, what should uh, cities be looking for? So, you know, minimum uh, standards for online voting, uh, it's, it's, it's something that I wish that I didn't have to be trying to advance, uh, that we might be considering other uh, technologies, but, um, but yeah, it's a fair question. So in the case of a DigitalOcean server, yeah, they didn't, have the, they, they didn't have the miscommunication with the co-location provider because they don't have, uh, I don't think DigitalOcean has um, load balancing uh, to the degree that, that, that they would need for a large election. Uh, so, so it's suitable for small elections. But yeah, if you want to run a larger election, you do have to have a co-location provider. Um, miscommunications happen. Uh, all the, I actually talked to a co-location provider, and we, we actually, until we figured out what actually happened, we, before we knew it was a miscommunication, we had uh, theorized that maybe they had typed in the bandwidth uh, and, and left out the least significant digit. And that would account for the, the ten, factor of 10. Uh, and apparently, these sorts of things do happen. Uh, but I think the idea is that we understand mistakes are going to happen, so what do we do about them afterwards? Well, I think the first thing that um, someone like Dominion uh, that experiences something like this, uh, the first thing they should do is uh, you know, do, do, do an investigation with the co-location provider, have that report written. That's all standard practice in an infrastructure environment if you had a, if you had a failure like that, and then make that report public. You know, so that we can all learn from what happened so that we won't repeat it next time. Now, Dominion s promises that that's not going to happen again, and they, they gave discounts to defected cities, so you know, hopefully the feelings aren't so hurt uh, about it. But uh, I, I think it's, it's just I, 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 any security system is a combination of technology, process, and people. Uh, so this was a people and process failure, not a technology failure. Uh, so I think we just need to be doing better on the people and process side. But... Um, when, when everyone's just kind of doing their own thing and nobody's talking to each other, it's easy to run into these problems. So uh, cybersecurity standards might help that, um, but we're, we're a very long way away from that. So I think it's going to have to be the last question. Okay, I was just going to ask, the, is the, are the benefits of allowing arbitrary clients like through a web, like, you know, at-home voting, it seems like you can never secure it. So compared to making people go to a centralized polling place and do something there, is there actually very much benefit to allowing people to vote at home that makes it worth all this headache that it causes? I understand there's still problems in the central voting yeah. center also, but it seems like the attack is so much harder there. You've you got to understand why um, election officials want to use online voting. You've got to understand they're, they're thinking on it. Um, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to reduce cost. Uh, they're trying to streamline their process. They, they're trying to innovate. They want to... Um, they want to increase people's franchise. If you're an uh, underrepresented group, you know, if you're in a remote community, you have a large uh, community that lives outside. You know, it's your cottage country, and so a lot of the sorry? disabled people. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, so so uh, um, that 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 so the um, uh, accessibility is a huge driver for it. I, I hear a lot of arguments in favor. I even hear, um, well, we're going to cut down on paper ballots, and that's going to save the environment. Uh, and I always say, you know what, you know what helps the environment. Um, democratic regimes, because uh, the authoritarian regimes are usually pretty bad for the environment. So I think the cost of paper actually, uh, in the long run, would, would sort of pay for itself. Um, but in terms of clients, okay, so in the research community, we do have sort of proposals where, you know, especially with this, something like a cryptographic land and verifiable scheme where you could go and check a code in a bulletin board and you don't have to use the, the potentially compromised device. You can use a different device. Anyone else can... Uh, check that code uh, you know, on your behalf. You can instruct them to check the code. So um, we do have ways of mitigating client-side malware. It's just none of those ways are being I explored in practice uh, at this time. So. so thank you again, Alex. Thank you.